So uh, yeah, welcome everybody to the last quantum uh, seminar of this series. In the background, you can hear our coffee machine starting up, <laughs> which is, sorry for this. Um, um, yeah. So today we have uh, Stefan Ulmer and um, he's from uh, Recon and uh, CERN and not affiliated with the MP Max Planck <laughs> Institute for uh, Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg. But that's where he uh, did his PhD in 2011 in the group of Klaus. No, um, I mean, Klaus Blaum was your second supervisor. I forgot your first. It was Wolfgang Quint. Wolfgang, Wolfgang Quint. Quint. Yeah. Exactly. And um, yeah, of course, we didn't know you from the base collaboration. So we are very happy to have you here. Uh, so please give us your talk, Stefan. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks very much for the kind introduction, Anne. Yes, uh, I will talk about the uh, efforts of the base collaboration. We are studying um, exotic physics with antiprotons and protons in penning traps. And um, this is what the base collaboration is. It's a <coughs> collaboration which contains um, <coughs> seven to eight institutions. And we are operating basically three, uh, depending on how you count, maybe four experiments. Um, one at the University of Mainz, where everything started, um, where we measure the magnetic moment of the proton and implement new technologies to further <coughs> advance the precision of our experiments. Then an experiment at the antiproton decelerator of CERN, which is meanwhile the main experiment where we measure the magnetic moment of the antiproton and also the proton to antiproton charge to mass ratio. Um, at Mainz, we also have meanwhile the base step experiment, which is being developed here within uh, <coughs> the group of Christian Smora. I will uh, later on flash a quick slide on this. And <coughs> um, then we have at the University of Hannover operated by Christian Ostrakaus, the QLEDs uh, laser cooling project. Um, these guys are trying to implement sympathetic cooling of protons and uh, <coughs> spin state, proton antiprotons spin state readout based on methods which are um, <coughs> inspired by, by quantum logic uh, <coughs> technologies. Okay, <coughs> here's a very quick overview and summary of achievements which have been made since 2011. Everything started at the University of Mainz, in fact, um, in the group of, in a collaborative group of uh, Jochen Waltz and Klaus Blaum, um, with the first observation of spin flips with a single trap proton, <coughs> um, which led then in uh, <coughs> later work to the first direct high precision measurement of a single trap proton using the double penning trap technique with a fractional precision of um, three parts in a billion. Um, and this measurement, um, which opened the perspective once applied to the antiproton to improve the antiproton magnetic moment at that time by a factor of two million, later by a factor of 3000, uh, <coughs> opened the portal to CERN and we got basically access to antiprotons in the antiproton decelerator facility um, <coughs> here at CERN. So with this, we also got um, basically access to uh, or the possibility to perform experiments, just one second, yeah, <coughs> or to, to uh, compare the proton antiproton charge to mass ratios. So this is meanwhile one branch of our experiments. The most important measurement which we have contributed in the last few years was without any doubt the improved measurement of the antiproton magnetic moment with a fractional precision of 1.5 parts in a billion. Um, <coughs> as already said, this improved uh, <coughs> um, previous results based on exotic atom spectroscopy by a factor of 2 million and um, results by other trap experiments, Jerry Gabriel's uh, um, a trap collaboration by a factor of 3000. And given this data set, we were also able um, <coughs> to set first constraints on the direct interaction between dark matter and antimatter with the 
very friendly and and <coughs> um, cooperative support um, by Dima Butka and and Yevgeny Stadnik. Um, and very recently, we have used our single anti-proton panning trap detection systems to uh, <coughs> derive constraints on the conversion of axions uh, <coughs> or axion-like particles to photons. Um, <coughs> however, in a rather narrow frequency or mass range. <clears throat> Here's an outline on my talk. Um, <clears throat> I start with a brief introduction and motivation to these experiments. We'll talk a bit in a slightly more general way about antimatter experiments. Um, we'll then switch to our experiments, which means mass and magnetic moment measurements. We'll talk a bit about um, transportable traps and <clears throat> future prospects um, of the base collaboration. So let me start with the introduction. <clears throat> um, there are several elephants in modern physics, which is kind of nicely summarized in this NASA figure here, <clears throat> um, which represents the energy content of our universe um, <clears throat> made up by 68.3% out of dark energy and 26.8% of dark matter and 4.9% uh, ordinary matter. <clears throat> okay, so, and within this uh, picture, I mean, there are many open questions, for example, the microscopic properties of, of dark matter have yet to be observed or understood um, at the laboratory level. Um, <clears throat> there are questions regarding the element abundance of the universe. And if we are just considering here these 4.9%, uh, which are basically, <clears throat> uh, well, what, what we are made of, um, <clears throat> there are rather big questions uh, why uh, <clears throat> these 4.9% even exist in a stable way. And this is the inspiration to our experiments. I mean, this obvious matter antimatter <coughs> asymmetry, which we are observing on cosmological levels. So <coughs> if you are combining the Lambda CDM uh, <coughs> Big Bang model with the standard model and plug the two together, I mean, Lambda CDM <coughs> um, uh, <coughs> leads effectively to a well understood cosmic microwave background, the understandable Big Bang nuclear synthesis scenarios described uh, the observed light element abundances as found in cold stellar nebulae quite well. If we combine how the, the two together um, and we would want to derive in principle the baryon to photon ratio in the universe, which is expected, or the baryon anti baryon ratio, we would end up at a baryon anti baryon ratio of one and a baryon to photon ratio of 10 to the minus 18. So, which means we would expect basically an entirely radiative universe. What we observe, on the other hand, is a baryon to photon ratio at the level of six times 10 to the minus 10 and a baryon to anti baryon ratio of about 10,000. So, um, summarizing this again, combining the lambda CDM model and the standard model, our predictions of the baryon to photon ratio are inconsistent by nine orders of magnitude. And this is, of course, a big question mark and a big worry and <clears throat> one of the uh, hotter topics in modern fundamental physics. Uh, <clears throat> to produce a matter-antimatter asymmetry, Sakharov uh, <clears throat> proposed some conditions which would allow basically the uh, development <clears throat> of, of uh, such an asymmetry and according to the requirements of his model, um, <coughs> matter-antimatter asymmetry can be produced if we would have B violation, which is plausible within <coughs> um, theories beyond the standard model, CP violation, which has been observed. However, it's by orders of magnitude too small um, <coughs> to uh, <clears throat> explain these nine orders of magnitude of effective difference, which are observed, and we would require an arrow of time, which is slightly less motivated. An alternative source uh, <clears throat> would be uh, <clears throat> to have one and two, however, CPT violation, because CPT violation adjusts basically the matter-antimatter asymmetry by a natural inversion 
um, <coughs> which is just given by the effective chemical potential if CPT would be violated. So, <coughs> and um, experimental signatures, which are hypothetically sensitive to CPT violation, <coughs> violating signals can be derived, for example, also depending on the model and so on, but very obviously can be derived from precise comparisons of the fundamental properties of <coughs> matter-antimatter conjugates. So to rephrase this um, slightly differently, this motivation, we are <coughs> basically testing CPT invariance. Um, and to say here something about the fundamentality of CPT invariance, so any relativistic quantum field theory which conserves CPT requires only five basic ingredients. And these ingredients are, first of all, that we <coughs> uh, require Lorentz and translation invariance, energy positivity, locality or microcausality, um, the existence of a stable vacuum ground state without angular momentum and, and momentum at all, and uh, <coughs> unitary field operator uh, <coughs> um, interpretation, I mean, which, which just means quantum field theory, um, <coughs> which, uh, <coughs> which with, with probability conservation. So if we have these ingredients, um, <coughs> we get automatically CPT invariance out. There are motivations to <clears throat> think about CPT violation. I mean, in addition to this argument, which looks attractive, um, <clears throat> there are several eff effective field theories um, <clears throat> derived from string theories, loop quantum gravity, non-commutative <clears throat> field theories, brain scenarios, or random dynamics models, which lead to CPT violation once projected basically to the, <coughs> uh, or, well, to our low energy four dimensional uh, <coughs> reality in which we are existing at the moment. So um, <coughs> the question is then basically which type of measurable signatures are <coughs> given the assumption that <coughs> something kind of from these dimensions, uh, dimensions here overlaps into the vacuum box of relativistic quantum field theories. Uh, so which type of measurable signals of these beyond standard model theories would be basically imprinted into uh, the, the, the um, vacuum of reality, right? So or to rephrase this, basically, what what is the Lagrange density um, of the of the universe? The realistic one uh, beyond standard model. And in order to try to find a way to uh, <clears throat> um, take care of these questions, Alan Kosteletsky and collaborators constructed an effective field theory which features local observer Lorentz symmetry, micro causality, energy positivity, and energy and momentum conservation. This is this standard model extension. And the standard model extension contains basically the standard model, general relativity, but adds CPT violation. So here you can see this is a Lorentz bilinear <coughs> of dimension four plus K. Um, <coughs> then <coughs> we have here an effective expectation value, which is kind of projected downwards from a higher dimensional theory into the four dimensional Minkowski space which is suppressed by an effective mass scale and scales with a yet to be determined coupling strength. So these are the typical extensions um, <coughs> of the standard model Lagrange density, the CPT and Lorentz violating extensions. Um, um, <coughs> to project this further down to a- Sorry, Stefan, quick question. Uh, uh, is it, can you go back one uh, the, to the previous one just for a second? Uh, I, do you really mean to say Lorentz symmetry? For instance, um, the title of uh, of Alan's paper that you quote is "Breaking of Lorentz Symmetry." Yes, I, th I think what he, I thought maybe it, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought what, that what he is trying to preserve in um, um, SME is um, observer invariance. So, so basically, things seen by different observers are not different. Otherwise, it would be 
crazy. But Lorenzo variance, I think he breaks. In fact, yeah, yeah, he 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 breaks it. That that's that's exactly that's exactly the point. But what what I want to say is that the uh, <clears throat> you know these operators they still transform within the Poincaré group in that sense. Mm -hmm. Got it. Is, yeah. I mean, but Lorentz symmetry is broken in these models. But the yeah, I was just confused by the bullet on the right. We said local observer Lorentz symmetry. So um, that's what confused me. Sorry. Ah, okay. Yes, but but I mean, uh, this 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 is uh, this is basically uh, um, what is. I, I mean, this is uh, this refers to the transformation behavior. Um, of these terms here, but these terms they break Lorentz symmetry and CPT invariance. Okay, let's go ahead. So, if we uh, if we further translate this down on um, this model here, so this here is now the minimal standard model extension um, to let's say laboratory reality. I mean to something like first quantization laboratory reality, um, we would end up here at an <coughs> effective Hamiltonian, which is extremely well known, which is just the penny trap Hamiltonian plus a perturbation. And this perturbation <coughs> um, comes, for example, from this CPT violating term. <coughs> so if we just do simple calculations here, you will effectively end up at a <coughs> A kind of pseudo magnetic field, and this pseudo magnetic field um, <coughs> would couple in a different way to matter particles uh, compared to antimatter particles. Um, <coughs> these, uh, this type of perturbation would also induce oscillatory signatures, um, <coughs> which means that. Uh, <coughs> If such an effect exists, uh, it should also be uh, visible basically by investigating matter particle spins, for example, and uh, um, <coughs> time dependent variation um, <coughs> within, let's say, uh, <coughs> a non minimal extension of the standard model. Um, <coughs> even such effective interaction Hamiltonians exist, which could be interpreted. Um, as the equivalence to the discovery of a boson field which exclusively couples to antimatter. And to such interactions, we would be sensitive with the base experiments, um, especially the magnetic moment measurements. So different tests of uh, CPT invariance have been carried out over the years. So um, very prominent and important um, is this K0, K0 bar mass comparison at a fractional precision uh, at the level better than 10 to the minus 18 electron and positron G minus two values were compared with fractional precision at the level of 10 to the minus 12. And these here are experiments which are conducted <coughs> at the antiproton decelerator facility of CERN. Um, <coughs> We have here fantastic experiments by Masaki Hori within the Asaksa collaboration, who is performing laser spectroscopy on antiprotonic helium. From these experiments, he um, extracts the antiproton to electron mass ratio, which provides one CPT test. Then um, also very prominent are the experiments from the Alpha collaboration. Um, they reported about three years ago on a first 1s, 2s uh, spectroscopy measurement of antihydrogen, which was then later improved to a fractional precision at the level of uh, <coughs> 2 times 10 to the minus 12. They also have get access to the ground state hyperfine splitting of antihydrogen. This has been measured um, <coughs> with about 100 ppm uh, so far. And then in base, um, <coughs> we determine the antiproton to proton charge to mass ratio and antiproton magnetic moments. So, um, in some sense, these experiments are complementary or can be combined to um, <coughs> get deeper insight into substructures and so on. For example, um, the 1s, 2s spectroscopy results um, <coughs> are 
mainly uh, <coughs> sensitive to the fundamental properties of, of, of the positron, um, <coughs> while the, the, in this type of spectroscopy, the <coughs> antiproton fundamental properties are suppressed by three orders of magnitude. Um, <coughs> Then in the ground state hyperfine splitting, um, if they would measure the ground state hyperfine splitting with PPM resolution and plug our antiproton um, magnetic moment values in and compare this to the hydrogen ground state hyperfine splitting, we would be able to look into the substructure of the antiproton. So um, as said, I mean, these experiments are done at the antiproton decelerator of SON, and here's an overview of the SON accelerator infrastructure. We get our particles from these pre-decelerator structure, which injects into the LHC, where we first have um, some Linux, the PS booster, the PS, um, <coughs> which accelerates protons to a momenta of 25 GeV over C. These particles are then guided into the AD target area where we, where antiprotons at 3.5 GeV over C are being produced. And these particles are then decelerated to 5.3 MeV and guided to experiments where they are further decelerated, degraded, electron <coughs> cooled, resistively cooled, feedback cooled. So that we are bridging basically within 120 seconds of accelerator cycle and 300 seconds of um, <clears throat> um, e experiment preparation cycle, something like 14 orders of magnitude in energy. At the moment, we have um, <clears throat> six active collaborations. Unfortunately, um, <clears throat> the ATRAP collaboration stopped their efforts. Um, <clears throat> so as said, base is taking care of the antiproton at the moment, alpha and asaxa on anti-hydrogen CPT tests. And then we have alpha, aegis, and chiba um, <coughs> with the uh, <coughs> physics program to test the weak equivalence principle by dropping anti-hydrogen um, in the gravitational field of the Earth. Here are some <coughs> historical milestones. This is a pretty busy slide. I also want to refer here to very important experiments by um, <coughs> the TRAP collaboration, um, Jerry Gabriel's comparing the proton, anti-proton charge to mass ratios in 1999 with a fractional precision of 90 PPT. The AD program <coughs> um, started around here in 2000. Then it took several years to get, in principle, the, the, the experiments prepared uh, <coughs> to be able to trap anti-hydrogen. And after the trapping of anti-hydrogen, several data points were produced here by the Alpha collaboration. BASE started in 2015. And since then, <coughs> we've uh, also contributed here to these proton, anti-proton, uh, <coughs> um, charge to mass ratio comparisons and specifically we measured the um, antiproton magnetic moment. So let's talk a bit about experiments <coughs> after this rather long introduction. Um, <coughs> so we are using panning traps and common to all panning trap experiments is that we have a superconducting magnet. Um, this is kind of the core of the experiment inside the superconducting magnet. We have our panning trap this is a multi-panning trap system, which I will explain later on. A lot of very sensitive detection electronics. Um, <clears throat> and these experiments are, of course, operated under cryogenic conditions. Um, <clears throat> just to give you an idea, I mean, the length of this structure, which you're seeing here, is about two and a half meters. So um, just as a quick reminder, the main tool is the panning trap. And the panning trap is basically just a very strong, very homogeneous magnetic field, um, <clears throat> which takes care of radial confinements of charged particles by the Lorentz force. And in order to prevent the particles from escaping along the magnetic field lines, we overlap um, to this magnetic field, the simplest potential you can think of, which is an electrostatic quadrupole potential. And in this superimposed um, magnetic field and electrostatic conditions, 
um, a single particle trajectory builds up, which is a composition of three independent harmonic oscillator modes, um, the axial oscillator, uh, the modified cyclotron oscillator, which is basically the free cyclotron frequency oscillation, slightly modified by the radially pulling potential, and then um, in addition, the magnetron oscillator um, <clears throat> due to the uh, uh, drift in the crossed electric and magnetic fields and what makes penning traps to specifically attractive tools to do fundamental physics measurements or very precise measurements of fundamental properties of trapped particles is that this um, Brown Gabriel's invariance theorem holds. This is a very robust relation, um, <clears throat> robust with respect to um, typical first order um, <clears throat> disturbances like misalignment of the electrostatic axis with respect to the magnetic axis. Um, <clears throat> so by measuring these three oscillation frequencies and evaluating the root of the square sum, we get access to the free cyclotron frequency and thus um, to the fundamental properties of the trapped particle, which is the basic idea of high precision mass spectrometry. If we are measuring cyclotron frequencies of different particles in the same magnetic field, um, <clears throat> we get basically access to ratios of charge to mass ratios if we combine the cyclotron frequency measurements with the Larmor frequency measurements, I mean spin precession frequency measurements, um, <clears throat> we get access to magnetic moments or G factors by measuring these two frequencies and <clears throat> evaluating the fraction of the two frequencies. So in summary, the determinations of charge to mass ratios and G factors in penning traps reduce in principle to uh, simple frequency ratio measurements. So in principle, these experiments are conceptually very simple. Um, we have full control and almost no theoretical corrections are required to get access to the quantities of interest. Because also the fields are in the panning traps are, are, are very low compared to atomic fields, for example. So we need to measure these frequencies um, to measure oscillation frequencies of charged particles in penning traps. Um, we use this simple concept here. Um, so consider that this particle here is charged and it oscillates in the trap. This induces image currents in the trap electrodes. And these image currents can be picked up by ultra sensitive detection systems. So what we are using here are LC circuits, in principle, just um, <clears throat> or superconducting inductors, which are connected to the trap and together with the trap capacitance, they look at a certain resonance frequency, like an, a pretty large resistor. And so basically we are measuring the voltage drops over these resistors together with <clears throat> uh, some low noise amplifiers, FFT analyzers and so on and so forth. That this principle works is shown here. What you can see here is the signature of a single excited antiproton in our penning trap, which is tuned uh, <clears throat> to excited and tuned to resonance with our detection system. <clears throat> so, as I said already, in base, we are using an advanced penning trap system. Um, <clears throat> this is a four trap system where we have a reservoir trap. Um, the idea of this reservoir trap is that um, it stores a cloud of antiprotons and suspends in principle here uh, <coughs> antiprotons through this high precision trap cycle, which consists out of a precision trap. This is a very homogeneous penning trap. I mean, homogeneous magnetic field. And we have a cooling trap. Um, <coughs> I, I will talk about the relevance of this trap later on and an analysis trap. This analysis trap is to perform spin flip spectroscopy experiments. So in this reservoir trap, we have a vacuum at the level of five times 10 to the minus 19 millibars, which is the best characterized vacuum or so far characterized vacuum to my knowledge, a typical antiproton storage time of the order of 10 years. So this means we do not have uh, more than 5,000 residual atoms in a vacuum volume of typically um, one liter, order one liter 
you have all the 100 to 1000 trapped antiprotons in our trap and that's a local inversion of the uh, um, antibion to bion ratio by compared to the, what what we have in the universe basically uh, 12 orders of magnitude um, and with this instrument, we investigate basically the, the properties of antiprotons very precisely. Which brings me to the first physics topic here. Um, this is the high precision comparison of um, the antiproton to proton charge to mass ratio. So in base, we've learned to um, create basically the following conditions. Um, we can we have here our reservoir trap and we can pinch out of our reservoir trap single antiprotons and store them in a park electrode and single H minus ions store them in a measurement trap. And then we have developed methods to measure cyclotron frequencies um, using, for example, this thermal equilibrium sideband method where the particle is tuned in parallel <coughs> um, with the resonant detection system. Uh, <coughs> Or alternatively, we can use a so-called peak method where we excite the particle um, <clears throat> and observe in principle the, the, the cyclotron frequency um, by direct image current detection. So this is how we are measuring the frequencies. And if we combine this um, with a scheme which we call internally fast shuttling, um, <clears throat> we can in principle transfer this particle configuration to this particle configuration here um, <clears throat> in uh, an effective time of something like, like 10 to 15 seconds. So the concept is then just that we measure basically the cyclotron frequency, um, <clears throat> shift to this particle configuration, measure the cyclotron frequency. Again, a cyclotron frequency measurement depending a bit on the resolution, which we envision um, per shot takes typically something like 120 seconds. So together with the shuttling, we measured basically one cyclotron frequency ratio in about 240 seconds, which is 50 times faster um, <clears throat> than in um, older experiments uh, carried out by the trap collaboration, for example. Um, we are not comparing protons and antiprotons. We are comparing antiprotons to hydride ions, negatively charged hydrogen ions. Um, the hydride iron, ion is a perfect proxy for the proton with negative charge. And if we compare basically hydride ions to antiprotons, <coughs> um, we avoid in principle trap potential inversion. Trap potential inversion induces huge systematic shifts because uh, the particle, the trap inversion, the potential inversion um, changes in principle the uh, <coughs> effective equilibrium position of the trap particle. So, and thus, uh, together with typical trap errors, we, which we have in our trap, <coughs> um, the effective magnetic field, which is experienced by the particle. So, a direct inversion. Um, would lead to systematic frequency shifts um, optimistically at the PPD level, parts per billion level. Um, if we want to do better, we need to compare particles with the same charge, <coughs> uh, charge sign. So <coughs> as I said, I mean, H minus is a perfect proxy currently limited still, um, but uh, to a level of 0 0.05 parts in a trillion um, <coughs> by the knowledge of the um, electron to proton mass ratio, which is measured um, <clears throat> at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics and the University of Mainz within the Lion Trap experiment um, by the group of uh, Sven Sturm and, and Klaus Blaum. Um, <clears throat> the next limitation is uh, <clears throat> the affinity energy of about 0.7 electron volts of the second electron <clears throat> um, on. Uh, bound to the H minus ion. And um, yes, I, I mean, this, this does not constitute any, any limit at this level of precision we are talking about here. To do experiments in accelerator hall is not, I mean, precision experiments is not that straightforward. We have a lot of magnetic field noise, as you can see here. This is the magnetic field 
um, <coughs> induced by the antiproton decelerator in the background. So this corresponds, or these magnetic field uh, fluctuations correspond in principle <coughs> with a period of about 120 seconds to peak to peak cyclotron frequency fluctuations at the level of five to 10 Hertz. Um, <coughs> so we've invented several uh, triggering and magnetic shielding multi-layer systems in order to uh, <coughs> get rid of this magnetic noise and to be able to um, measure at high fractional resolutions. Um, <coughs> we also observe very clear day-night differences um, in the stability of the apparatus and so on and so forth. And we were working quite hard in the last two to three years to um, understand the situation better and, and suppress in principle the effects of this background magnetic field noise. So um, what has been published um, based on a very first experiment is a, an antiproton proton charge to mass ratio comparison at a fractional precision of 69 parts in a trillion. And together with all these improvements and um, uh, uh, an effective measurement sequence which acquired 35,000 frequency ratio measurements over one and a half years with a considerably improved experiment stability. So currently we are here at this blue experiment stability while this first experiment was performed at this red experiment stability. Um, <clears throat> so we have acquired this data set here and using two different measurement methods um, together with tunable axial detection systems to suppress the dominant systematics and an entirely rebuilt trap apparatus, especially the cryogenic mechanics. Um, <coughs> we converged here to uh, <coughs> basically two values uh, <coughs> which improve the fractional precision of this measurement here. I mean, this is still data analysis in progress, but it looks like uh, <clears throat> um, we are able, so this value here is kind of evaluated and fixed, improved this year by exactly a factor of three together with this second measurement, which is based on a peak detection technique. Um, <clears throat> we may win another factor of two in the final experimental precision, but <clears throat> um, this is work in progress. So <clears throat> regarding physics, um, what is interesting here is one specific uh, interpretation or consideration we can use this um, <clears throat> proton, antiproton charge to mass ratio comparisons to constrain in principle gravitational anomalies um, <clears throat> interacting exclusively with antimatter or in, uh, rephrased in different terms. Um, we can basically test the weak equivalence principle, the weak equivalence principle with clocks. So um, just to explain the basic idea of this experiment, I mean, consider a matter clock and an antimatter clock in absence of um, any gravitational potential and let's assume CPT invariance. Then um, the two clocks would run um, by definition um, at exactly the same frequency. So <clears throat> if we turn now the gravitational potential on, um, <clears throat> and there would be a weak equivalence principle violating effect uh, <clears throat> in a way that it interacts with antimatter or couples to the energy content of the antimatter clock in a different way than to the energy content of the matter clock, then we would experience or different gravitational redshifts, okay? And from the fact uh, <coughs> that we've measured here CPT invariant results, we can then derive basically constraints on this anomaly uh, <coughs> parameter, which may modify the <coughs> uh, gravitational interactions um, <coughs> or discriminate different gravitational interactions um, <clears throat> between matter and gravity and antimatter and gravity, okay? So <clears throat> this is the limit which is uh, being derived if we plug into um, <clears throat> this model in principle, the gravitational potential of the 
local galactic supercluster. Um, what we can do as well, I mean, given this long-term measurement here, um, we can use the variation of the gravitational potential sourced by the elliptic trajectory of the Earth around the sun. Um, <coughs> here's the effective variation. And given this data distribution here, um, <coughs> we can set another constraint, which is now a differential constraint um, in a gravitational system, which is very well understood within um, even classical physics, but also general relativity. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a, a perspective for data analysis, but it looks like we will be able to set very similar constraints based on this uh, <clears throat> as planned by, um, or as envisioned uh, <clears throat> by collaborations like, like Chiba, Alpha G and uh, and each is. Mm -hmm. Of course, these experiments are complementary. I mean, <clears throat> um, the, the anti hydrogen weak equivalence principle test and the clock weak equivalence principle tests, they test they are, are sensitive to partly disjunct physics mechanisms. <clears throat> Okay, regarding physics constraints, which are derived um, <clears throat> from these experiments, um, we've set the most stringent direct limit on <clears throat> this SME um, CPT violating coefficient RH minus. This is the minimal SME, and from <clears throat> the non minimal standard model extension, um, given our new measurement, we improve in principle the coefficients uh, <clears throat> of in our geometry in total 16 different possible interactions or interactions possible within the SME by a factor of four to five. Regarding progress um, <coughs> towards higher precision in these experiments, I mean, initially we have used these dip detection techniques which are limited by um, <coughs> the, the properties of the interaction of our detection system with the particle. So we call this spectrum noise. We have used a peak detection technique, um, which is limited by also spectrum noise, magnetic field noise, and um, <coughs> an effect which we call thermal excitation noise. Um, <coughs> recently, we have switched to <coughs> so-called phase sensitive detection techniques. But we do not measure the frequencies directly. We are measuring basically the free phase evolution as a function of an evolution, as a function of, of evolution time, um, and get access to the cyclotron frequency by unwrapping the phase here. Okay, um, these experiments look even more promising than these direct peak detection techniques. And with these experiments, we've reached uh, finally frequency scatters while the accelerator was off um, at a level of 200 ppt per shot where one shot took something like uh, about 200 seconds. I mean one unwrapping measurement. <clears throat> so which improves basically the precision of the previous best experiments um, <clears throat> by about a factor of four or the frequency scatter by about a factor of four. Um, <clears throat> and um, of the older sideband measurement experiments by a factor of eight. So in principle, we are prepared to go ahead with um, much better experimental methods and a, a, a higher fractional resolution of our frequency measurements while the AD is off. Um, in addition to this, we are also working on suppressing the dominant systematic shift we have, which we have at the moment, which is the systematic shift um, induced by a residual in magnetic field inhomogeneity um, in our precision measurement trap, which is at a level of 23 ppt per, per Kelvin axial temperature. So this system is <coughs> will be ready to be installed for the next anti-proton run. So um, with these developments, we are in principle prepared to uh, um, tackle frequency measurements or charge to mass ratio measurements with fractional precisions at the level, um, let's say sub 10 parts in a trillion. That's at least what we are hoping. However, we still have this problem, which is illustrated here. 
this year is our frequency stability during the Christmas break, our frequency stability while the uh, other users in the uh, facility are active and the frequency stability where the AD is gone. Um, so to profit from these methods on the long term and to also be able to further improve these methods, we need to bring the antiprotons um, in principle to a calm environment. Um, <clears throat> thus, we've, we are currently working on the development of a transportable trap. So Christian Smora is doing this at the University of Mainz. The project is called Base Step. Um, <clears throat> the idea is basically to accumulate antiprotons in a transportable reservoir trap and afterwards transport the particles out into a calm offline laboratory. Currently we are discussing with CERN about the properties of, of, of this offline laboratory. Um, <clears throat> yes, and, and to, to kind of get a, a very calm lab here on the CERN campus, which is basically, which uses STEP as a particle source, as an antiproton anti source in this offline laboratory. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of progress on Christian's side. He, he ordered the magnet already, designed the apparatus and so on and so forth. So progress here looks very good and we hope to be able to transport first antiprotons maybe already at the end of the 2022 beam time, but <clears throat> at least by 2023. Okay, so with that, I'd like to finish this first part talking about charge to mass ratio measurement let's let's talk now about measurements of the antiproton magnetic moment um, and just as a reminder again from a, referring to a, an earlier slide um, to measure the antiproton magnetic moment we need to measure the cyclotron frequency this is straightforward this is based on image current detection we also need to measure the Lamo frequency and uh, Lamo frequency measurements um, on protons and antiprotons in penning traps. These are really difficult experiments. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, uh, the, let's, the, the Lamo mode is a precession motion. So <clears throat> this is not accompanied by any shift of charge. So we don't get access to <clears throat> um, the Lamo precession via a direct image current detection technique as in these cases here. So in order to get access <coughs> um, to the Lamo precession, we need to apply a trick which has been um, successfully uh, <coughs> invented and uh, used by Hans Demelt and this is called the continuous stern gallach effect. Um, <coughs> this works as follows. So consider the magnetic potential of a magnetic dipole in a magnetic field, okay? So if we superimpose now on our initially homogeneous panning trap, a magnetic field in homogeneity, um, <clears throat> the interaction of the magnetic moment of the particle with this quadratic inhomogeneity, which we call the magnetic bottle, um, adds in principle a spin dependent quadratic axial potential um, <clears throat> to the electrostatic axial trapping potential, which means that the axial oscillation frequency becomes a function of the spin eigenstate and the effective axial frequency shift is logically proportional um, to the magnetic moment of the particle, proportional to the strength of the magnetic bottle and anti-proportional to the mass. Um, <clears throat> this concept has been applied with great success uh, in measurements of <clears throat> electron and positron magnetic moments or also, for example, in Sven Sturm's experiments at the University of Mainz to uh, <clears throat> or, um, <clears throat> highly charged ion uh, G-factor spectroscopy. The problem um, in our case is that the magnetic moment of the proton is compared to the magnetic moment of the electron by about a factor of 658 times smaller. Um, so while single electron spin flips are more straightforward to detect, um, single antiproton spin flips are extremely hard to see. 
So um, what we are doing then in that case here is that we superimpose on our trap apparatus a magnetic bottle with the strength of 300,000 Tesla per square meter. This means that if we deflect the particle from the center of the trap by one and a half millimeters, the average magnetic field, which is experienced by the particle changes by a Tesla. So a Tesla in a millimeter, this, this is a pretty terrible a magnetic field gradient, and it's not so easy to control a single particle under such uh, <coughs> extreme magnetic field conditions. And in that case, a single antiproton spin flip causes an axial frequency shift of about 170 millihertz out of typically 600 kilohertz. So <coughs> if this principle um, works, that that we are able basically to detect antiproton spin flips. The measurement of the LAMO frequency is then pretty straightforward. We just measure the axial frequency, induce a spin transition, measure the axial frequency again, and <clears throat> repeat this for um, many times and different drive frequencies. And by these experiments, we get access to the spin flip probability as a function of the drive frequency which leads to such a, an asymmetric LAMO resonance. And the interesting frequency, the zero energy LAMO frequency is defined by this sharp cutoff. Okay, so um, we applied this single penning trap technique um, in 2017 to measure the antiproton magnetic moment in the magnetic bottle performed six LAMO resonance measurements and 12 cyclotron resonance measurements and were able to um, extract the, <coughs> uh, um, the magnetic moment of the antiproton with a fractional precision of 0.8 parts in a million. Um, <coughs> as said, this was done in the single penning trap, which has this terribly broad line shape here or line width. And the question is um, whether we can do better and um, yes, we can, <clears throat> um, also based on a technique which has been developed at the University of Mainz in the group of Günther Wert um, <clears throat> during the time, according to my knowledge, when Hartmut Hefner was a PhD student in his group, and this is the so-called double penning trap technique. Okay, <clears throat> um, this works as follows. Um, we start with a single antiproton in this analysis trap and initialize the spin state of the particle. Afterwards, we shuttle the particle to the precision trap. In the precision trap, we will measure the cyclotron frequency while driving spin transitions. Afterwards, <clears throat> um, we transport the particle back to the analysis trap with the strong magnetic bottle. Um, and analyze the particle's spin state. So depending on the reply which we get from <clears throat> these analysis trap measurements, we can conclude whether we have flipped the spin uh, in the precision trap or not. So, but this effectively means um, <clears throat> that we are applying basically exactly the same principle as in these experiments here. However, in the homogeneous magnetic field of the precision trap, where the magnetic field homogeneity um, <clears throat> is by five orders of magnitude higher. I mean, <clears throat> the gradient five orders of magnitude lower than in this analysis trap, which is required to detect basically <clears throat> um, the, the spin transitions. So this measures the spin flip probability in the homogeneous magnetic field uh, <clears throat> of this trap here. Um, by that, you, you get easily a factor of 1,000 in experimental resolution. The kind of holy grail experiment uh, <clears throat> or holy grail requirement, which is needed in order to be able um, to apply this double penning trap technique is single antiproton spin flip resolution. Um, <clears throat> which means that um, we need to be able to resolve the quantum ladder with a very high fidelity. So <clears throat> within basically one spin flip experiment, we need to be able to see this in order to be able to initialize the spin state correctly and test or read the spin state correctly out. And this is difficult. 
This is difficult for the following reason. Um, <clears throat> so the magnetic portal does not only couple spin magnetic moment to the axial frequency, it also couples radial magnetic moment, so cyclotron magnetic moment to the axial oscillation frequency. So, <clears throat> and already three cyclotron quantum transitions corresponding to an effective energy difference of um, <clears throat> only 300 nano electron volts are sufficient um, <clears throat> to destroy in principle the spin state detection resolvability of the, yes. So three cyclotron quanta destroy basically the measurement. So we need to be able to stabilize the energy of the radial mode um, <clears throat> to uh, <clears throat> To, to, to have the radial mode stable uh, <clears throat> at, the, at the level of 300 nano electron volts in typical measurement times of about 120 seconds. Okay, thankfully, <clears throat> um, the radial heating rate, I mean, which drives basically the cyclotron transitions <clears throat> um, is proportional to the main quantum number um, <clears throat> of the radial state. So if we cool basically uh, the radial mode to subthermal energies um, using a method which we call subthermal cooling, um, <clears throat> we are able to resolve the spin transitions with very high fidelity. And this here is illustrated here. For example, this here is a cold particle, which means the cyclotron temperature is at the level of 50 millikelvin, where we can clearly resolve the spin flip ladder. I mean, in this experiment with a fidelity much better than 90%. However, if the particle is hot, uh, hot means in this case one Kelvin, so 86 micro electron volts, um, <clears throat> we lose in principle our ability to resolve the spin state. <clears throat> this is one reason why we are working at the moment um, at the University of Mainz and uh, as well at the University of Hanover on experiments to resonantly couple laser cooled beryllium ions um, <clears throat> to the axial mode of the proton, then transfer in principle the low axial temperature to the radial mode and get basically <clears throat> um, the, the cyclotron mode cold in a quasi deterministic way. So this subthermal cooling takes in principle per single uh, cooling attempt something like several hours. Um, and this is one of the dominant limitations um, in our current G factor measurement. So we, we need some, some cooling mechanism, which is faster. And this is being developed in the um, Waldsblaum Smora lab at the University of Mainz and the <coughs> Christian Osbekaus lab at the University of Hanover. There's very good progress um, in both projects. At the CERN experiment, um, <clears throat> we found another way, another, uh, <clears throat> yes, an, another way to uh, <clears throat> um, get this basic double penning trap idea implemented. Um, so the idea is, uh, <clears throat> or the concept is based on the idea of dividing uh, the double penny trap scheme to two particles. So we have one hot cyclotron particle in the precision trap, which continuously measures the magnetic field of this trap. And then a very cold particle in the analysis trap, um, <clears throat> which, which has a high spin state detection fidelity. So <clears throat> this method works as follows. Um, we <clears throat> start here with this particle which is radially cold by definition, so only prepared once, um, <clears throat> and analyze the spin state of this particle. Afterwards, we measure the cyclotron frequency in this trap here. And we transport this particle configuration um, such that this particle ends up here in a park electrode, and this particle in the center of this trap. We perform spin flip spectroscopy on this particle, induce here a spin transition, transport this uh, particle configuration back to the initial condition, measure the cyclotron frequency again, 
Um, <clears throat> and afterwards, we analyze the particles spin state again. Okay, <clears throat> so what we pay for this is that we measure in principle with two particles at different mode energies. This induces systematics, however, at a controllable level, so controllable at the level of 0.5 ppb. Um, <clears throat> what we win is um, at least 60% of the time, which is usually used for subthermal cooling cycles. Um, <clears throat> this triple trap method, that's how we call it, uh, <clears throat> um, translates basically the cooling time into um, quality frequency measurement time. And <clears throat> by applying this triple trap scheme, we've managed to uh, <clears throat> measure the antiproton magnetic moment with a fractional precision of 1.5 parts in a billion. Um, and that, as already said in the introduction, um, improved the fractional precision of previous experiments by about a factor of 3,000. In our experiment at the University of Mainz, we homogenized the apparatus, um, <coughs> um, implemented better cyclotron detection systems, uh, <coughs> and applied the same method, which was first applied by Andreas Moser um, in the Mainz lab. So Georg Schneider did these experiments and he was able to improve um, <coughs> this first measurement here by about a factor uh, <coughs> of 11. So <coughs> this here corresponds to a proto-magnetic moment measurement with a fractional precision of 300 parts in a trillion. This here is a summary slide regarding physics limits. Um, <coughs> we extract here basically uh, <clears throat> from this measurement, new SME limits and improve all these coefficients here. Um, <clears throat> I mean, on, on, on these exotic interactions, which I've explained in the introduction, which are kind of predicted or result basically from the standard model extension, we constrain here in total <clears throat> um, eight new SME coefficients also. Um, <clears throat> Uh, um, by a factor of 3,000 better compared to what has been done before. Then there was this super nice collaboration um, <coughs> uh, with Dima Budka and Evgeny Stadnik in which we've uh, basically investigated some modulations um, <coughs> of the Lamo resonance, um, <coughs> which could be imposed um, <coughs> by a coupling of axions to the antiproton spin. Um, <clears throat> the idea in these axion models is always basically that axions are oscillating at the Compton frequencies. And if they trans translate basically to <clears throat> um, standard model fermions, they <clears throat> would in principle induce um, <clears throat> some characteristic frequency signatures um, on line shapes so which means side bands on the spin line or modulations on the spin line broadening of the spin line and so on and so forth and all these methods have been analyzed or all these effects have been analyzed um, using hypothesis tests um, <clears throat> this is work which has been mainly done by christian smora um, <clears throat> with an interpretation provided by yevgeny and dima um, <clears throat> we were able to improve previous astrophysical limits on the interaction um, <coughs> of axions with antimatter by five orders of magnitudes. Um, however, I mean, this is still four orders of magnitude less stringent than um, the usual uh, <coughs> matter axion interaction constraints. So <coughs> regarding the status of, of this experiment, what we have basically at Mainz is this 1.5 uh, ppb measurement now with a considerably improved apparatus um, compared to the status of this initial experiment, much, much more stable magnetic field. And at Mainz, we have the methods available um, <coughs> which enable us to measure at effective G-factor resonance line width at the level of 1.4 ppb. So if we combine the best of both worlds, I mean the uh, <coughs> um, developments of the Mainz experiment together with the um, 
considerable improvement medical field stabilities and phase sensitive detection methods, which are now available at the SON experiment. We are pretty optimistic to be able um, to improve in a next generation experiment, the anti proton magnetic moment um, <clears throat> to a level of about 80 PPT to 200 PPT, something like this, which would correspond to a factor of 10 to 20 improvement um, <clears throat> compared uh, <clears throat> to this result here. We are also planning to <clears throat> apply our really sensitive analysis trap methods to directly measure the um, <clears throat> magnetic moment of uh, helium-3. This is a project operated together with uh, Klaus Blaum and my lab and um, <clears throat> that's an experiment um, which is led by Andreas Moser, who was um, earlier also a member of the base collaboration. So last but not least, I think time's almost up, but <clears throat> let me quickly flash uh, <clears throat> a recent paper um, <clears throat> in which we have used um, our single particle detection systems to um, <clears throat> derive constraints on axion and axion-like particle conversion into radio frequency photons. Um, <clears throat> so we have these superconducting detection systems which are sensitive enough to um, detect signals of single trapped particles. So the question was, can we do anything else with these detection systems? And here <clears throat> also again, I mean, there's this important feature that cold axions and axion-like particles are oscillating at the Compton frequencies. And there is an effect which is called the inverse Primakov effect, which you understand much better as I do, I guess, uh, which converts axions into photons in strong magnetic fields of superconducting magnets. So these are, I mean, this has been basically the electrodynamics has been worked out by CKD and collaborators and um, Jack Devlin, who is currently a member of the base team, has translated this um, into um, a panning trap experiment. So uh, the takeaway information is that in our magnetic field geometry um, and our detection system geometry, the magnetic field, which is sourced by axions, um, can be hypothetically sourced by axions can be directly picked up with our toroidal axial detection coil coils, which we have anyway mounted in our experiment. This is how the detection system looks like. And the basic idea is <coughs> then just to understand here um, <coughs> the residual noise signals on our detection systems and <clears throat> compare in principle axion induced signals um, compared to the measured noise spectrum signals um, based on hypothesis tests and, and, and um, um, extract from this kind of data treatment just limits on axion to photon conversion. Um, by principle, this is um, very similar to um, what collaborations like ADNX, SLIC, Abracadabra, dark matter radio, and so on are doing. Um, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, the nice thing in case of panning traps is, I mean, there's always the question of whether the noise flaw of the detection system is well understood in these experiments to really derive appropriate limit. And there the panning trap um, provides a very nice technique to use the single particle basically as a thermometer um, <clears throat> to get in principle uh, direct access to the noise temperature of the detection system. So we can just measure this temperature without any model assumptions. Okay, <clears throat> um, combining these ideas to the measured noise limits, um, <clears throat> we have recently published a paper on a very narrow band limit, um, which have been, has been derived from our experiments um, <clears throat> there are different uh, <clears throat> limits which are provided, for example, here by Fermi Lad um, <clears throat> in this band, um, excess X-ray, <clears throat> uh, um, um, gamma ray experiments, um, supernovae, and so on. 
Um, <coughs> here is this unconstrained gap. Um, and exactly in this gap, we were able to set narrow band limits. Um, as said, this is work which has mainly been done by Jack Devlin. Um, <coughs> regarding future projection, I mean, this was now um, achieved with the panning trap experiment. And in panning trap experiments, we limit our, the sensitivity of our detection systems artificially in order to uh, not limit uh, or, or to, to not damp the particle too much, right? I mean, if we would measure it too broad line width, um, we cannot measure precisely anymore, but we are damping our detection system. So if we would kind of boost our detection system to the maximum available quality factors and project our technologies basically to a purpose-built experiment, <coughs> um, which is operated at higher detection Q, lower temperature, higher magnetic field, and also a, a, a larger volume if we would build a, a, a purpose-built device. So these are the limits which we were setting um, <coughs> um, with our recent data analysis and the currently available data. Um, <coughs> with this purpose-built experiment, we are optimistic that we uh, <coughs> could improve the peak sensitivity of the experiment by at least a factor of about 200. And currently we are also developing in principle tunable capacitors, tunable lossless capacitors, um, <clears throat> which would increase our detection bandwidth by a factor of 3000. And just yesterday in the lab, this has been demonstrated for the first time with a, <clears throat> uh, a purpose-built device, um, which has been developed by um, our bachelor student, Frederick. Um, <clears throat> yes, so there, there is perspective to squeeze something out of uh, these experiments and the available technologies. And with that, I'm coming to the end of my talk. Um, <clears throat> I reported on the status of an improved proton-antiproton charge to mass ratio comparison. Um, <clears throat> I've reported on an improved measurement of the proton magnetic moment by a factor of 11 and <clears throat> an improved measurement of the antiproton magnetic moment by a factor of 3000. We used these data to set first constraints on um, <clears throat> antimatter axion like particle interactions. Um, <clears throat> and very recently, um, we've even used our <clears throat> single particle detection systems as direct antennas to search for axion-like particles. We are also developing a transportable pending trap to advance our, the precision in our experiments in the future. So I hope um, these efforts will continue for a few more years. And uh, we are hoping for improved measurements at, well, factors of 10 to 100 improvement, depending a bit on, on how uh, <coughs> things will progress. Before I will want to thank you for your kind attention, I'd like to announce um, that we have open PhD positions specifically at Space Step at the University of Mainz, but also Space Sun and, <coughs> uh, and, and Base Hanover. So if anyone is interested, um, <coughs> especially at Mainz, please, please talk to Christian Smora or Jochen Walz. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Wow, Stefan, what an impressive tour of your activities. Really uh, interesting to see. Uh, normally, we end the quantum <laughs> seminar at 3.30, but I'm pretty sure that we have uh, quite a few questions. Um, so if you have questions, do it like Dima and uh, raise your hand, and then we just um, like ask you to unmute yourself and ask it. So Dima, please start. Yeah, thanks Stefan um, for the very interesting talk. Um, I wonder this uh, amplifier uh, that you showed towards the end, what is the temperature of this amplifier? And, um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, thinking whether it might be possible to somehow uh, use this technology uh, that you have also to, to measure uh, NMR signals, uh, like, uh, I mean, it's also NMR, but uh, I mean, more like in the Casper mm -hmm. <laughs> Con, uh, context, yeah. 
Yes, I, I, I think um, with an appropriate coupling mechanism, it, it would be easy and you, you could easily amplify your signals. The temperature um, of our detection amplifiers in this case, not feedback cooled, is at 5.8 Kelvin. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, and we are currently working on, let's say, technologies to, to improve basically the, the noise temperature of the detection system. I mean, in principle, for example, what Jerry Gabriel said, I think this is the most ambitious experiment, um, panning trap experiments in temperature units. What Jerry Gabriel said, uh, um, obtains in his frequency measurements with a dilution fridge um, <clears throat> is something like at the level of one Kelvin, not feedback cooled, which he gets down to something like 300 milli Kelvin, as far as I remember. I mean, also based on um, uh, um, gallium arsenide field effect, field effect transistor technologies. But what is the physical temperature of the uh, amplifier that you have? The physical temperature of the amplifier in our device um, is consistent with the temperature which we are measuring with the particle. So the physical temperature of the detection of the detection system at that time was at five Kelvin. Um, and we are measuring with the single particle 5.8. Super. Yeah. We Stefan. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, thanks, Stefan, first of all, for the nice talk. Um, I have a question because um, uh, I'm sort of struggling with my PhD analysis. And I'm, um, well, I, I do have a question regarding your traps, like, um, well, for your measurements, you need like really, really good uh, uh, tunability. So can you comment on like um, a, a basic rough number? What C4s and what C6s are you actually using for that measurements? We, we are using these five electrode compensated traps, right? What C C watts? Maybe maybe. Yeah, what is it about? These, these are in principle the the um uh, the the higher order extension coefficients, just really the the potential coefficients which add up here um to this electrostatic quadrupole, right? And the the trap is designed in a so-called compensated and orthogonal way. Um, <clears throat> which means that with five electrodes, we have basically three degrees of freedom. Um, these three degrees are in principle, the le respective length to diameter ratios here of these traps uh, <coughs> or of these individual electrodes. Um, <coughs> and they are defined such, I mean, the dimensions are defined such that um, C4 and C6 vanish or disappear basically uh, <clears throat> at a certain tuning ratio. They, they are simultaneously set to zero. So what we are only observing is a C8 coefficient, while C4 and C6 um, are zero. Um, if, if you want to have a reasonable number or a, a number which, which maybe tells you something, I don't know, um, some people are talking about frequency shifts in, 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 in units of uh, fractional C values, I find the, um, for example, for C4, the axial frequency shift as a function of the tuning ratio, kind of an, a very illustrative number, which is in our case at 30 millihertz per milli unit tuning ratio of axial frequency shift. Um, while we are able to optimize um, <clears throat> our tuning ratio to the level of um, five times 10 to the minus six to 10 to the minus five. So something like this. So we are talking, let's say about uh, order for, for 40 microhertz um, per, <clears throat> per axial Kelvin. Is, does, this, does this answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Okay. Um, are there more questions? Uh, I have probably one. Um, I guess uh, unless you measure um, in a dedicated underground lab, you would get always some, uh, let's say, magnetic disturb, field disturbance. Um, 
I'm not involved in, in Christian Smoller's project, and therefore I'm asking what would be the gain uh, for transporting this anti proton from CERN to, to mines? And that's a very difficult question. Uh, that's in that sense a very difficult question since um, you know what we are envisioning is we, we are reaching now with these experiments limits um, where many different disturbing effects start to play a role. Um, but what I can tell you is that if the magnetic field is stable and calm, uh, this basically defines the resolution of the experiment apart uh, from an always present um, relativistic effect, um, which contributes in phase sensitive frequency measurements to cyclotron frequency scatter. Um, yes, so <clears throat> we are optimistic given the current techniques which we have available. Uh, to be able to improve our current experiments by, uh, I mean, also the mass measurements by another factor of 10. Um, and if we get the particles transported out of the facility, I mean, the, the very, one very important aspect is, of course, um, <clears throat> that we are basically operating continuously under extremely stable magnetic field conditions. So we have much more quality measurement time um, and also the chance to optimize and understand basically our residual noise effects. And this is very important. So uh, while during operation in the AD hall, especially while the accelerator is on, we are in principle completely blind um, with respect to background effects which are limiting us um, if we are talking about frequency measurement, frequency measurements at parts per trillion resolution. And I think this is kind of the dominant gain and, and the hope uh, <clears throat> that if we will transport our um, particles out of the facility, we have in principle continuous high quality uh, <clears throat> um, background noise conditions in, in our laboratories. So, um, yes, and then also really depending on, on how basically other methods are being developed, like, for example, if the Christian Ospikos experiment will work well and we will be able to um, measure frequencies at, let's say, close to Doppler temperatures, uh, <clears throat> um, the magnetic field is stable and so on and so forth, we, we get our factors of three and another three and another three and maybe in the end of the day a factor of 100. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, are there more questions? Otherwise I start asking questions but I do have a few. <laughs> um, uh, maybe starting with when you start transporting antimatter through uh, Germany do you anticipate like security problems with conspiracy theorists? Yes. <laughs> It, it will be terrible, ter terribly difficult to, to get the particles to Germany. So um, that's, that's we've, uh, we've applied, first of all, um, for an offline laboratory at CERN. Yeah, but uh, you, you should start with bananas because they are more radioactive than, than uh, single particles there, you know? Antimatter. Yeah. Uh, anyway, maybe. I, I will invite you to the next meeting of um, <clears throat> Of, of step together with the Sun RP people, then you can um, explain these arguments. I think yeah. that from your side would be very convincing. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, on a more serious note, I mean, you're excluding axion uh, photon coupling and axion uh, gradient coupling um, effects. And uh, did you compare them? Like, how do your limits compare? The limits are by four orders of magnitude different um, because the, the single particle detector, I mean, this, this is really a, a direct cavity experiment, right? I mean, very similar to, to ADMX slick. So that we do not rely on any, let's say, um, hypothetical asymmetric um, axion to antimatter coupling or so. This is really the direct limit 
which we are uh, the, the direct axion to photon coupling limit in this uh, mass range of 2.79 nano electron volts, while um, the, uh, the, the, the differential limit, um, the let's say axion antiproton spin coupling um, has the, the limits are by four orders of magnitude less stringent because we are doing these experiments with single antiprotons. So we are not very sensitive. And, and I was wondering a bit about your uh, the exclusion that you show there, um, like in the scalar coupling case, so the um, axon to photon conversion exclusion. I mean, I would expect it to have the shape of your line shape somehow, but it doesn't. It looked like flat, r roughly flat, if you know what I mean. I, I, I think I know what you mean. And this, what what you're saying is, I, I mean, this this is in principle in this plot um, just basically averaged out. Um, you're talking about this one, right? And so the, yeah. the question is now, um, <clears throat> why don't we see here basically the 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 resonator line, right? Yeah, I mean, or, or let's maybe maybe just take as a uh, as a simple startup. What, what's the resonator line in this plot or in this unit? Is it much broader or is it narrower? This width here corresponds basically to the detection bandwidth um, of one FFT shot um, <clears throat> with a width of two hundred hertz. Uh, and and what's the uh, resonator line width? The resonator language itself um, is at a level of uh, wait something like ten hertz or so, twenty hertz. This this order of magnitude. Okay, then I would expect it to uh, show some like uh, trailing off at the edges here. Why doesn't it do that? Um, <clears throat> that's a very good question. Um, and to be honest, on it, I need to. Uh, I need to think about it and send you a reply by email. There is one argument uh, that if we do the explicit signal to noise ratio calculation, um, this edge effect cancels out. But I, need, I I don't have this on spot at the moment. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think we have uh, something. I, we discussed this with Kent Urban, I think. Uh, I don't remember. But I mean, that the signal to noise basically doesn't change if you go away from resonance uh, along those lines. Yes, there is one um, additional transfer function, but this is this is what, what I mean. I, I don't have this on spot at the moment and don't have an extra slide prepared. Um, but but I, I, I can send you a reply by mail. That would be nice. Yeah. Um, uh, there are other questions by other people. It's also probably should, we should um, we could also close the seminar. Maybe we have another, uh, maybe I can ask one last question in the official seminar, then we close at fifth, like 3.45. Um, you also showed the L invariance uh, of, I don't know, the proton measurement, anti-proton measurements, I think. And the L invariance looked like there is like substantial drifts. And uh, however, all your Gaussians that you showed, like there, all your Gaussians that you show, they are super nice centered around zero. So I wasn't sure what the Allen deviation here and how does it, uh, I mean, why, why, I'm like, you, you know what I mean? It's like, if you see an Allen deviation or Allen variance like this, then I would expect to see non-Gaussian uh, like line shapes in the final results somehow. But yours, everything looks super nice and Gaussian. Yes. So, uh, um, yeah. Um, it, it depends a bit on what you plot. So I, I mean, these red points are in, so this here is the Allen deviation if the AD is on. This here is the Allen deviation if the AD is off. Um, this here is the resolution of our frequency measurements. So I mean, here we would expect a Gaussian which would then drift away. But if we are evaluating subsequent ratios, that would still be a Gaussian. Um, and I also have to say that um, this year is the condition of basically a very old experiment, which has been done a few years ago. Well, at the moment, we are operating here. So um, 
our frequency ratio measurements um, <coughs> take place with a sampling rate, which is somewhere here, um, <coughs> which is entirely Gaussian. Well, thanks a lot. Um, mm -hmm. If there are no uh, other urgent questions, I would uh, close the seminar now. And uh, well, it's the last seminar, quantum seminar of this uh, season and if uh, of this semester. If you have ideas for the next seminar, uh, please let us know. I mean, uh, I think Mustafa and I, we continue to organize it for a bit longer. Um, we had a, I don't know, I think it's actually, to be honest, for me, it's fun to organize this. Uh, I really like it. And it also forces me a bit to pay more attention to the uh, general pretty <laughs> impressive talks, you know? <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, so if you want someone uh, in the next semester, please shoot us an email. Um, we uh, well, well, Helpful, yeah. we'll definitely consider it and try to invite those people then. So thanks a lot, everybody. And uh, seminar is closed. <laughs>